to Grand Rounds, I would like to introduce and welcome uh, Dr. Dipendra Chaudhry as our Grand Rounds speaker today. Dr. Chaudhry is an assistant professor of medicine in the Department of Medicine section on, on hospital medicine. After receiving his medical degree from Kathmandu Medical College in Nepal, he completed his internal medicine residency training and chief residency at Bassett Medical Center, an affiliate of Columbia University in Coopertown, uh, New York. Since arriving at Wake Forest, he has served in a variety of roles. As the director of the Global Health and Observership Program in the Hospital Medicine for Visiting Clinicians, he has mentored several physicians globally. In education, he has served on the M&M Committee for the Hospital Medicine, CME director, taught physical exam skills and case presentations to medical and PA students, and, as the teaching at and has served as the at teaching attending on the admission teaching service for residents. Dr. Chaudhry's research interests include evaluating the impact of multidisciplinary team-based patient care and systems process improvement. Dr. Chaudhry is the founding and current president of the Piedmont Tri Triad Chapter for the Society of Hospital Medicine and has served the society in numerous roles. On behalf of the Department of Internal Medicine, please join me in welcoming Dr. Dipendra Chaudhry. Thank you, Rita. It's great to be here. Thank you, everyone, for joining with me this morning. So I'd like to begin by sharing a very personal story. I want you all to meet my son, Adi. So he was born premature after he was diagnosed with intrauterine hypoxia and had to undergo uh, emergency C-section. So right after his birth, he suffered a series of medical complications, uh, including hypoglycemia, tense pneumothorax, respiratory distress, and cardiac tamponade. He spent about a month in the NICU. He's now six and has been diagnosed with periventricular leukomalacia, severe cerebral palsy, severe physical disabilities, has seizure disorders, uh, visual impairment, he visits the Wake Forest Baptist Health System regularly. And he receives uh, multiple therapies on top of his regular doctors. You might all be wondering why I'm sharing this story with you all today and what has my story got to do with this Grand Round today. I tell you all this story because my story represents one of those many patients who make frequent visits to hospitals and clinics. And you might also be wondering, like, what has got to do this with the student's presentation of patient experience? I challenge you all that if you are in my shoes and if you were to make hospital visits and clinics, it's not just the clinical quality that would matter. It's going to be the experience of the visit that's going to matter the most as well. So I am a hospitalist physician, and I take care of hospitalized patients, many of whom have acute and chronic medical issues, like my son. And we see them at the worst point of their life. And I'm very positive that it's the experience that matters to them the most as well. So this brings us to a common topic of discussion today about patient-centered care and patient experience. Some of you already know that value-based purchasing program has tied patient experience 25% in its reimbursement program. If you look clearly into the chart, that it's not just the patient experience, it's actually the clinical care, efficiency, cost reduction, and patient safety. They all are equally weighted as 25%. So you can see Patient experience is also considered to be one of the pillars of the CMS program. It is a keystone of high value care. So the hospitals who understand, they maximize on their patient experience. They put in processes in place that help them gain 
competitive advantage over other organizations. So today, by attending my grand rounds, you'll be learning about the definition of patient experience. We'll discuss how other industries have improved customer experience. I'll also describe reasons why EdgeCast is not the best tool to assess for patient experience. I'll list the drivers that influence patient experience, and I'll explain why it's important to measure patient experience. We'll review certain key strategies how top hospitals maintain competitive advantage by improving patient experience. And finally, we'll also review stages of patient journey and design a mapping tool. So what is patient experience? I would say it depends who you ask. Who are you asking? So I'd like to use a proverbial analogy of a six blindfolded people who are touching an elephant and describing the elephant according to the parts they were touching. Do you think they were wrong? I don't think so. I think they were right, but from their own perspective. So if you bring this to in the healthcare setting, you can see similar phenomenon going on. You may ask the chief medical officer, he might have a different view of patient experience. He might say, it's patient safety. You might ask the chief wellness officer, who might say, it's patient engagement or family engagement that's important for them. Or if you ask the chief informatics officer, they might say, it's actually the telemedicine that actually forms a big chunk of the patient experience. So it, however, it's very important that an organization know the definition of patient experience. The reason it's important is because it has to fit into their strategic vision and goals. But I'll tell you something. Patient experience is not just about patient satisfaction. And I'm not here to talk about patient satisfaction. Patient satisfaction might just mean some flashy amenities aimed at improving or just trying to make the patients happy. So let's review some definitions of patient experience. It's a measure of patient centeredness. Society of Hospital Medicine defines it as everything we say and do that affects our patients' thoughts, feelings, and well-being. The Burial Institute is a global community of practice dedicated to improving patient experience through collaboration and shared knowledge, defines patient experience as the sum of all interactions, excuse me, the sum of all interactions shaped by an organization's culture that influence patient perceptions across the continuum of care. Cleveland Clinic, hands down, they are the front runners in improving the patient experience, defines it as everyone and everything people encounter from the time they decided to go to the hospital until they were discharged. I want you all to look at this chart very carefully. Let's focus on the episode. Episode means the hospitalization, or maybe just an encounter with the healthcare settings. And the arrows around the episode represent the patient's journey. You might think, let's improve the patient experience by just improving the episode. That's the wrong concept. Look at the arrows. So traveling, so the arrows represent the patient's journey. The patient experience even begins even before the patient actually comes in contact with hospitalizations or, or healthcare organizations. And also, patient journey and patient experience encompasses that after the patient has left the episode, you'll have to get the patient right back to where the patient belongs. This is called the patient experience 360. I repeat again, patient experience 360. And managing this 360 continuum is a challenge. So a trivia question for you all. When is the National Patient Experience Week in 2019? Can I see some hands? Is it A, February 16 through 20? Or is it B, March 10 through 16? I don't see any hands. Or is it today? Great, thank you, I see two hands. Or is it May 26 through 30? 
Well, the answer is today. So happy National Patient Experience Week, everyone. So how did you all get here? The patient-centered care has been described as early as 1950s. In 1969, Enid Boleyn described two kind of pathological uh, diagnoses. One is illness-oriented medicine, where we as a clinician are trying to look for a localizable diagnosis. Say, for example, femur fracture. There's another set called, uh, sorry, a patient-centered medicine called overall diagnosis. This is on top and above and beyond of illness-oriented medicine. Like say, for example, a femur fracture from frequent fall. In 1988, Picker Commonwealth Program for Patient Center Care and Picker Institute were formed. They described eight dimensions of patient center care, and they are access to care, continuity and transition, involvement of family and friends, emotional support, physical comfort, information and education, coordination and integration of care, or respect for patients' preferences. So in 1999, Institute of Medicine came out of this paper to err is human building a safer health system. The first two lines of this paper read, healthcare in the United States is not as safe as it should be, and there are 98,000 deaths due to preventable errors every year. Two years later, Institute of Medicine came out with another landmark paper called Crossing the Quality Chasm, a new health system in the 21st century. So this paper reviewed lots of disappointing qualities in healthcare, like gaps in efficiency, timeliness, and patient-centeredness. They described six aims for improvement in the healthcare. I call it the steep with a three E. We all love mnemonics. So healthcare should be safe, it should be timely, it should be efficient, it should be equitable, and most importantly, it should be patient-centered. So following the steep is only gonna help you cross that quality of chasm. Institute of Healthcare Improvement came up with these triple measures. I call it the three Ps, a population health, per capita cost, and patient experience again. So what is patient-centered care? It might sound like a cliche by now, but a 1984 study of a physician-patient communication interactions showed that on average, a physician will listen to a patient for only 18 seconds, actually before interrupting. Do you all think is this patient-centered care? So patient-centered care considers patients' cultural traditions, their personal preferences and values, their family situations, and their lifestyles. It makes the patient an integral part of a care team who collaborates with care providers in making clinical decisions. Picker Institute defines it as improving healthcare through the eyes of the patient. So now that we know that some definitions of patient experience, let's see, Beryl Institute came up with an expanded perspective on patient experience, where they have included patient and family engagement at the core and other quality and safety measures, and the other circle overall is the patient experience. What is the current state of patient experience? So multiple healthcare executives and hospitals were interviewed as to what best describes the current state of their organization's patient experience effort. 56% said they either had established patient experience program or they were making some sort of progress. Again, so multiple healthcare executives were interviewed and they were asked, what was the top three priorities for their healthcare organizations for the next three years? Patient experience tops the list, followed by employee engagement and cost reduction. 
So now let's switch gears and see how do patients choose hospital. So for commercially insured patients, there are multiple research which indicates that U.S. patients and physicians are more and more likely to base their choice of hospital on non-clinical aspects of visit, like convenience and amenities. But there are very few hospitals which have what it takes to deliver a distinctive experience in the way other hospitality industries have done. So it's very clear that there's a lot of competition out there. Therefore, a U.S. hospital will have to invest in the capabilities needed to learn what these patients want and to deliver the experience that could attract them. So let's try to answer these three questions. The factors influencing the patient's choice of hospital, have you ever requested a specific hospital from your physicians? And would you request a hospital if it were distinctive for patient experience with all other things being equal? So the factors influencing patients' choice of hospitals, 41% chose patient experience, 41%. So that's not a question. Have you ever requested a specific hospital from your physicians? Again, 42% requested a specific hospital. The reason I bring this up is it all shows where the patients are going to. Another trivia question for you all. Would you request a hospital if it were distinctive for patient experience with all other things being equal? Can I see hands for A? What about B? Would definitely request. Hmm, that's 100%. <laughs> you guys are better than this McKinsey study, actually. 56% would definitely request. So now let's switch gears and discuss how other industries have improved customer experience. Let's take a trip to Disney. So Walt Disney once said, whatever you do, do it well. Do it so well that when people see you do it, they will want to come back and see you do it again. And they will want to bring others and show them how well you do what you do. I think this can be applied very well into our medicine. So what are the three Disney principles that they apply for their amazing customer experience. So they create an organizational common purposes, which represents to all employees what you stand for and why you exist. And it is also the primary tool for getting everyone on the same page. They understand their customers holistically. Your knowledge of the customer must extend far beyond the boundaries of traditional service criteria. So truly understanding their needs, wants, and experience is key to creating personalized interactions. They view exceptional service as an economic asset rather than an expense. So the return on investment associated with lifetime customer relationships often justifies the short-term cost associated with designing and deli delivering the customer experience. So how do they do it? So they observe and understand the interaction through the customer's eyes. They shape and redesign the business from the customer's back. And they perform and align the organizations to deliver against tangible outcomes. I want to touch upon touch points. So what are touch points? It's a point of customer contact from start to finish. As you can see, they focus really well on the touch points, and they're doing an amazing job. All the touch points get 90 plus scores. But the ultimate journey is a failure. It's 60%. What went wrong? What happened here? So the point of this slide is touch points matter, but it's the full journey that really counts. Let's bring this to healthcare settings. So these are all the various touch points of the patient contacts who might be trying to improve their ED throughput time, their ICU stay, 
but it's ultimately the patient's complete journey actually that matters. So what has got performance on journeys got to do? So it improves customer satisfaction by 30 to 30 percent and is very directly linked with better business outcomes by 20 to 30 percent. So what's the takeaway then? So all patient satisfaction should be linked to the organizational desired business outcomes. They should identify the strongest influences on patient satisfaction. And this should uncover operational insights that enable the frontline staff to make continuous improvements. So now we'll sift and discuss why EdgeCaps is not the best tool to assess patient experience. So what is EdgeCaps? As you can see, it's a hospital consumer assessment of healthcare providers and systems. So in 2008, CMS mandated that U.S. hospitals gather data on patient satisfaction by distributing the EdgeCaps survey. EdgeCaps gets our attention because it is a reporting requirement for most, and the results are public, and the scores influence reimbursement levels, as you saw in our previous slides. Fast forward, in 2012, CMS began including the EdgeCaps data in a value-based purchasing program to establish a definable metric for patient experience. So EdgeCaps is actually a definable metric for patient experience. A chief patient experience officer at Mayo Clinic spoke in support of EdgeCaps. He said, keep in mind, these data are reflective of patients' perception of their care. Whether or not we as providers agree, that perception is legitimate. Did you know that almost 50% of healthcare executives make the mistake of measuring experience exclusively by means of a narrow edge caps metrics, which is this report in an inpatient care setting. Although edge cap scores are important to meeting short-term goals, a hospital that strives for long-term success and market leadership must implement patient experience incentives that go far beyond edge caps. So a few things about edge caps. So improving HCAP score may help health systems increase the CMS reimbursement and also avoid penalties. It allows comparison among hospitals, incentivizing to make improvements in how patients experience their care. Like any other surveys, it also comes with some harsh criticisms. There's been long delay between care and the survey delivery. There is a low response rate less than 30% annually. And there is also potential for selection bias and limited usefulness of the high level of data I provide. So the takeaway from SCAPS is we should not be doing patient experience work just to drive an SCAPS score. And we certainly shouldn't measure the success of our patient experience program on the basis of an SCAPS score. We know the SCAPS scores will improve because we are all good at doing the right things. Okay, so now uh, let's move on and discuss about the drivers that influence patient experience and explain why it's important to measure the patient experience. So why do we need to know the drivers of patient experience? We all know the Accountable Care Act. The Accountable Care Act links performance related to patient experience metrics to reimbursement. A poor performance and patient experience means a negative impact on hospital economics. Not being clear about the drivers can be a significant barrier to launching any sort of patient experience initiative. Also knowing the drivers helps leaders to identify the most effective ways to achieve quick victories. We also need to know the economics of the levers are very different if you compare with the private rooms, which are cost prohibitive in comparison with the improving communications between caregivers and patients, which can actually bring down costs by improving the medical outcomes. 
There is also increased employee engagement level. We know engaged employees perform better. So what drives patient experience? So let's discuss some push and pull forces. So the push forces are making the status quo uncomfortable. There is this huge consumer movement going on, which is saying that it isn't only ours to decide. There are many patients' rights. There are patient safety issues. The voice of patients who have been harmed by medical care are more visible to hospital boards and consumers. There's increased transparency demand. And there's always ongoing healthcare reforms. In contrast, the pull forces are making our future look very attractive. And the reason is, we know that improved patient experience is associated with improved clinical, financial, and staff satisfaction outcomes. There is better chronic disease management. Caregivers are seeking a better patient experience for ourselves, for our patients, and for our families. <coughs> Let's list a few primary and secondary drivers that drive patient experience. So in the primary drivers, leadership is the major driver. It has to come from the leadership level. So the executive leaders should demonstrate that everything in the culture is focused on the patient. It should be a patient first culture. The heart and mind of the caregivers should be fully engaged. There should be a respectful partnership between patient and family needs. There should be reliable and evidence-based care 24 seven. The secondary drivers actually help achieve the primary drivers. So the accents of the leaders must match their words, senior leaders must be highly visible in meaningful ways. The patient and families should be treated as partners at, in care at every level. There should be compassionate communication and teamwork. The physical in, environment should support care and healing. Now let's discuss, so why measure patient experience? So organizations who have better patient experience, they have a better safety records they have a better financial margins. There is increased engagement, which leads to decreased burnout. <coughs> so I want you all to look at this graph very carefully. It's a very important slide. So this chart shows the rate of safety events indicated by the patient safety per selected indi indicators called the PSI score. So PSI score is a composite measure of readmissions, length of stay, and hospital acquired conditions called HACs. For hospitals in the top and the bottom quartiles of various areas of patient experience, which includes nursing care, cleanliness, physician care, and overall likelihood to recommend. So the blue dots represent the top quartile hospitals, and the brown dots represent the bottom quartile hospitals. So for every comparison, the clinical quality performance was better in the hospitals in the top quartiles. Let's review. Let's look at the physician care. As you can see, there are fewer hospital-acquired conditions, there are shorter length of stay, there's lower readmission rate of 30 days, and there's a better safety performance, which are all better in the top quartile hospitals. Another paper which did a systematic review of evidence on the links between patient experience and clinical safety and effectiveness outcomes, which included mortality, physical symptoms, length of stay, and adjacency treatment. They summarized evidence from 55 studies. And the conclusion was there was consistent positive associations between patient experience, patient safety, and clinical effectiveness. There's positive associations between patient experience and self-rated and objectively measured health outcomes, including adherence to recommended treatment and preventive care. 
and there is, again, improved engagement. We know engaged employees perform better. So the takeaway is patient experience is positively associated with clinical effectiveness and patient safety and supports the case for inclusion of patient experience as one of the central pillars of quality in healthcare. It supports the argument that three dimensions of quality should be looked at as a group and not in isolation. And clinicians should also resist sidelining patient experience as too subjective or mood-oriented, divorced from the real clinical work of measuring safety and effectiveness. So now let's discuss and review a few key strategies how top hospitals maintain competitive advantage by improving their patient experience. I'm sorry, there's another question for you all. A patient has been brought in by an ambulance from an outside hospital ER facility two hours away for emergent medical treatment. So the patient was accompanied by a family member. Which of the following actions best demonstrates that the family member's needs have been anticipated? Is it A, visiting with the family members while in the hospital to identify and address needs? Or is it B, providing comfort kits with personal care items to family during their stay? Or is it C, surveying the family members after discharge to identify their needs should they return? Or is it D, offering special room service to provide family more food choices? Any takes? About E, meeting them in the emergency room. <laughs> That's a smart answer. <laughs> well, the answer is providing comfort kits with personal care items to family during this day. Believe it or not, that's where we are headed. I would take that. So now let's discuss how Cleveland Cleaning, who've been a front runner in improving their patient experience, they improved their patient experience from mediocre to top in the nation. So this is a Harvard Business Case Review, uh, Cleveland Clinic improving their patient experience. If you guys all have a chance, you should read this case study. So for many hospitals, for many people choosing hospital, the anticipated patient experience trumps the medical excellence. It's so like most hospitals, especially the prestigious ones, the Cleveland Clinic focused solely on the medical outcomes. It took great pride in this US news ranking as they were the best in the cardiovascular care in the world. The then CEO was very concerned actually. And he said, patients were coming to us for the clinical excellence, but they did not like us very much. So this was an impetus for them to improve the patient experience. I would very highly recommend you all to read this book called Service Fanatics by Dr. Jim Merlino, who is the Chief Patient Experience Officer at Cleveland Clinic. And in this book, he has described how uh, their journey was while improving their, working on improving their patient experience. So how did they do it? So they made it a strategic priority. I repeat again, they made it a strategic priority. They understood that it was not only the medical outcomes that mattered, so they embarked on the journey by leading the change. The way they did this by modifying mindset and behaviors of their 43,000 employees. They got buy-in from all the stakeholders. They even created the first chief patient experience officer position ever. They publicly acknowledged the problem by broadly publicizing CMS results and outcomes data on providers. They created processes to understand their patients' needs. They even interviewed former patients who had taken their CMS survey and they asked why they had answered each question the way they had. They even created better communication and a better transition of care program. They started calling, and they made everyone actually 
called caregiver. And the embedded changes by creating multiple processes into their daily operations. They continue to engage and motivate their employees. They even created a caregiver recognition programs. And also, they set patient expectations that patients are not right all the time. So this approach, they were able to increase their patient satisfaction score to 92nd percentile, which was best in the country then. So what's the takeaway? It's a huge cultural change. So changing culture and processes to improve the patient experience can lead to substantial improvements in safety and quality. A patient-centered approach to care, which includes giving patients an outstanding experience, is not an option anymore. It's a necessity. Now let's talk about a different healthcare system where they used a kindness approach to improve their patient experience. So ECLA Health adopted kindness into their vision statement. And their vision statement read, healing humankind one patient at a time by improving health, alleviating suffering, and delivering acts of kindness. So they did this by embracing kindness. They communicated their kindness vision. They recognized kindness to both individuals and team. They told stories about kindness and celebrated kindness. They communicated better. They put their patients first. They even created a patient communication formula called C-Care, where they connected with the patient. They introduced themselves. They communicated. They asked and responded to the family or patient's need. And they made courteous exit. They also changed the way they were rounding. They started including the UCLA healthcare executives called the patient leadership, patient experience leadership rounds twice weekly. Where they would convene, they would recognize the patient experience leaders and the frontline staff. They would go to the Jemba and they would round with the frontline staff and get the first and feedback, and they would debrief and assign patient experience related issues. So through this methodology, they were able to increase their patient experience from 60s to high 80 percentile. Now finally, so let's review stages of patient journey and design a mapping tool to improve patient experience. So what is patient journey mapping? It's an overview of different stages which a patient is experiencing during the process of healing. It's a holistic approach to solving a problem. It will help gain insight in the interactions, emotions, and barriers for the patients. So patient journey mapping has used design thinking to solve patient experience journey problems. So quickly, quickly design thing. It's a creative human-centered problem-solving approach method. It leverages the power of empathy, a collective idea generation. There's rapid prototyping, and there's continuous testing to tackle complex challenges. Feedback is sought very often, especially from the patients. So the various stages in the patient journey mapping includes that you have to have an understanding of the system. You have to be able, be able to define the axis better, find emotions, and start solving the problems and create ideas. So how do you understand the systems? So there are various subsystems in the, within the systems, which could be like ambient conditions, the physical and social environment. There could be various actors, which could be human or non-human. The actors are important because 
they contribute to the healing process. There are various stakeholders, it could be like personal or group or organization that has interest or concerns in an organization. Their contribution is to the organization, however. So to understand the system better, let's review a few actors within the subsystems. The reason it's important we know these systems, subsystems and the actors is because they all contribute to the healing process and they all ultimately impact the patient's journey. And ultimately, they all impact the patient experience. So like the various actors in the ambient subsystems could be like temperatures and light, and in the physical environment could be medical equipment and furniture, and in the social environment could be family and caregivers. There could be policies and structures in the organizational factor subsystems. So they all ultimately affect the patient's journey and the patient experience. Next, in defining the axis, we should be able to identify which are the most significant actors that are actually affecting the patient's journey and try to create an interdependencies among them. We need to structure the actors in a concentric map where the patient is at the center, the actors closer to the patient are more relevant. And you might want to focus on those actors to improve their journey because they have the most significant impact. And next is structuring the events during the journey. And this need, needs to be mapped on a timeline. So we need to place the most relevant actors on top. And we need to fill in all the actors that we think are relevant. Next is again, coming back to touch points again. It's a phase in which the activity of an actor takes place. We need to fill in all the touch points and we need to describe it using a verb. Say, for example, Dr. Chari was in the patient's room and examining the patient. And finally, we need to try to find the emotions. It's important because we, it's the most unique aspect in designing this tool. It gives the first hand user experience. It helps identify the problem. It also helps identify the types of emotions especially the positive and the negative ones. So with this, I'd like to conclude by a few take-home points that you guys can take as to why we should care for patient experience. If you remember, the definition is very important. It's the sum of all interactions shaped by an organization's culture that influence the patient's perceptions across the continuum of care. We should not be doing patient experience work to drive an HCAP score, and we certainly shouldn't measure the success of our patient experience program on the basis of an HCAP scores. We know the HCAP scores will improve because we are doing the right work. I want you all to encourage you to think about the patient experience 360. Everyone involved in patient care should be referred to as caregiver. Kindness is the foundation of any cultural transformation in that improving patient experience. <clears throat> and finally, organizations with better patient experience also have a better patient safety record and better financial margins and is one of the central pillars of quality in healthcare. I'd like to end by a quote by Dr. Donald Berwick from Institute of Healthcare Improvement. We are all guests in our patient's life instead of hosts in our healthcare organizations. As you all step out of this room today, I want you all to think, what can you do to improve your patient's experience? So I'd like to thank my family for giving me permission to talk about my son. I'd also like to thank Dr. Gary Rosenthal for giving me this opportunity to present at the Grand Round. And I'd like to thank all my colleagues from Sexton Hospital Medicine. And I'd also like to thank my MBA teammates from Wake Forest School of Business, Class 2019. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Chowdhury, for that talk on that very important topic. Um, does anybody have any questions for Dr. Chaudhry at this time? 
Dr. Rosenfeld? Kendra, th thank you for uh, taking on this uh, topic. It, it's an area I think that's often, you know, misunderstood but increasingly important. So um, let me, you know, ask you, you, you know, you highlighted, you know, uh, these sort of broad institutional initiatives that the Cleveland Clinic, you know, had taken on and UCLA had taken on. But in, in the absence of, um, you know, such a broad uh, institutional approach, how would you answer, you know, the question that you ended with? I mean, what, what would you recommend, you know, the two or three things that an individual physician could do, um, you know, to impact the patient experience? I mean, I, I wish you knew, I wish that there was a, you know, the right recipe for that. But Again, like we just have to go back into the uh, definition of patient experience. Like, what's our like you know organizational cultures and strategy? I know when we do not have a broad support, we still have to think in terms of patient experience 360 again, and think into into the subsystems, and also in terms of the touch points, which are actually you know the most you know high impact. I think the best way would be like you know, uh, I mean we know the touch points. Uh, make an impact, but still it has to be in the grand scheme of things. It, ha it has to be the complete patient journey. So I think two things mostly would be like you know you know patient and physician communications, and the compassion, kindness. Uh, you know, uh, you know on our, our nine Ardmore in the hospital floor, we follow this technique. You know, physician communication. You know, commit to sit. You know, those are little things. You know, but you know I think at the end of the day it makes a huge impact. You know, uh, on patient. So you know. Personally, me, I favor kindness, compassion, communications, and commit to seat. So I think those are, you know, small things. Probably means a, a lot to our patients. Thanks. Anybody else have any questions? <coughs> yeah. <laughs> My question is always, what does this have to do with a progressively aging population that we care for? their panoply of chronic diseases and through time. So again, like, you know, my answer is again, patient experience 360. At what point in your journey you've had that negative experience or the positive experience? And if it's the negative experience that needs to be fixed, we just have to come about with, you know, processes you know, small pilots, and, you know, it should be tailored to the patient's needs. All right. Thank you, Dr. Chaudhary. Thank you.